I thank the organizers, Joy and uh, Cristobal, Pamela, and Michelle for their very kind invitation to this great meeting. So my talk will be roughly divided into two parts. One is very basic science, which I'll try to make in intelligible to the uninitiated. It's a sort of esoteric area of uh, biology, which I, but in the second half of my talk, I hope that I'll convince you that it is not without its uses. In other words, the, it'll be on the applied aspects of our research. So it's on the zygotic transition, and specifically we're working on rice, and the second part is the application to self-propagating hybrid crops. So we'll st I'll start with the basics. The facts of life are that fertilization leads to embryogenesis. You should all know this, that when a sperm and an egg get together, you get this cell called a zygote. That's at f after fertilization. And in both plants and animals, uh, flowering, you have a t smaller sperm cell that fuses with a large egg cell and gives rise to a single cell called the zygote. And it is this single cell that then goes on to make a, a baby or a seed, in the case of uh, animals or plants, respectively. So this is an unusual cell in, in the sense that it is a product of two terminally differentiated cells. Both the egg cell and the sperm cells have reached the end of their differentiation programs. If they don't fertilize, that's it, they die. They will not further differentiate. Uh, but when they fuse, you have a cell that now is totally potent. It's the ultimate stem cell in the sense that it can regenerate all the cells and tissues of an organism. Now, this implies, of course, that there must be extensive reprogramming. And something very fundamentally uh, important must be going on in the zygote to reprogram it from these two differentiated cells into something that's capable of an organism. So this zygote obviously consists of egg cell and sperm cells. And the question of how this cell is formed um, and what are the contributions of the two parents to this uh, magical, if you like, cell uh, has been uh, long uh, considered during the history of humankind, starting with Aristotle, who thought he had the answer, and that uh, as he, and he said that, uh, that mother provides matter, father provides form, and obviously when you combine matter with form, you have an animal. And, uh, uh, since he never really explained what matter and form are, it, it, it's a little unsatisfactory. However, uh, the ma uh, here is where this topic rested for about 2,000 years until a breakthrough was made by this great uh, developmental biologist called Ethel Harvey in the 1930s. And she performed these amazing experiments with sea urchins uh, basically, she was able to re remove the nucleus of a sea urchin egg and show that it could divide and make an embryo without any nucleus. And, and this is quite astonishing, and it, she concluded correct, and that early embryogenesis depends only upon maternally deposited factors. And uh, it has now, and her findings have been validated to be generally true for all animals. So, and here's a short summary of what's known in animals, that the zygotic genome is not transcribed for several di cell divisions. So this makes sense in, in, uh, of Ethel Harvey's experiment where we could go on without a nucleus because you really don't need that genome. But at some point it does come on and early on it's maternal mRNA and maternal proteins that drive the, the uh, embryonic divisions. So this is zebrafish and other animals are similar. That it's maternal RNA until about 256 cells and that's when zygotic transcription comes on. And there's also a microRNA that then starts to uh, remove the maternal mRNA. So this process of initiation of zygotic trans transcription is called zygotic genome activation or Z G A, and that's delayed in, an, in all animals. What about plants then? Uh, much less has been 
done on plants, but in recent years, quite a, uh, it has received quite a bit of attention. Uh, most of the work has been done in Ar Arabidopsis, the model system of choice. For and, but it has led to somewhat uh, inconclusive conclusions, if you like. Uh, and there are two schools of thought on this. One is that there's full-scale activation of the zygotic genome right after fertilization with equiparental expression. And th there's papers on this. And uh, the, con the contrarian view is that it's slow activation of the zygotic genome with a strong dominance of the maternal allele. And these are papers that have supported, in support of this second model. So when we started working on this, I was actually working on Arabidopsis at the time, but I realized that it was quite difficult to, uh, to look at the earliest stages of fertilization in Arabidopsis. It's a matter of just accessibility of, these, of the zygotes and the small size and so on. So we switched to RISE as a model for the following reasons. First is that RISE is one of the first fastest, it's a speed champion for pollination to fertilization in 30 minutes after you apply pollen, your fertilization. What does that mean? It means that you can time stage very precisely the, dif uh, the different stages of the zygote. It also means that uh, because the RISE zygotes are much larger, you can, there are techniques to isolate living zygotes, which are developed largely by my collaborator. And I'll tell you that in a minute. But thirdly, and I won't uh, belabor the fact that rice is an important crop, which you've heard before, but it is also, uh, you might be surprised to learn, a major crop in California. And this is the University of California Davis experiment station. So in other words, there was, it was not that difficult for us to work on rice seed. So, this isolation of living zygotes is uh, the work of Scott Russell, our collaborator in Oklahoma. And this just shows you that uh, you can isolate living zygotes. This is uptake of a vital dye, FDA, uh, showing that, that they're alive at zero hours. That's the unfertilized egg cell, one hour after pollination, 2.5 hours. Already you can see structural changes taking place in the zygote uh, within such a short time after fertilization. That's because the process is very quick in rice. And, with, and if you take a time stage, then at about two hours after pollination, you get uh, karyogamy. That's the fusion of the egg and sperm nuclei has taken place. Uh, and by 12 hours, by five hours, the nucleoli have fused. That corresponds to S phase, DNA synthesis. Then G2, and then finally, M phase at 12 hours after pollination. You have a two cell embryo. So we focused on these stages after nuclear fusion and before cell division for our transcriptomic analysis. And I'll summarize here. All of this is published in this paper, um, 2017. Uh, but these are MA plots. The, the y axis shows you expression related to the X cell. Above the line means they're up relative to the X cell. Below the line is down, down regulated. The red dots are statistically significant. The X axis is level of expression of the genes. So you have more significance when the genes are more highly expressed. You can see from these plots that uh, several hundred genes are already up or down relative to the X cell at the 2.5 hour stage. And by the nine hour stage, several thousand genes are up or down relative to the X cell. These are differentially expressed genes, twofold up or down. This, uh, numbers are given here. So to give you an, an idea of the magnitude of this, um, if you compare with human embryos, to get to similar levels of differential expression, gene expression, you have to go to at least the eight cell stage in a human. So plants do within the first cell division what animals take several cell divisions to execute. In other words, zygotic genome activation is very, very quick and immediately it takes place soon after fertilization. So then, of course, the next question is, what are these genes that are being transcribed? And uh, we'll, this is a way of representing clusters of genes by the patterns of gene organization, uh, gene expression 
uh, in a time series, and they're called SOMs, or self-organizing maps. And uh, basically, the darker the color, red means lots of genes in that cluster. And some genes go all the way up, some genes come all the way down, some go up and then down, and so on. So genes that go up consistently include DNA replication factors and histones. This is what you might expect because this, the zygote is going from G1 phase to S phase. So naturally, DNA replication and histones would be needed. Um, and uh, a bunch of, trans of genes are down, including several transcription factors present in the X cell. It, this is, again, expected because it's de-differentiating away from being an X cell. So it makes sense that you downregulate X cell transcription factors. And there are a bunch of genes that go up that included certain embryogenic transcription factors. So these are obviously of great interest because they might be promoting the transition from an X cell to a zygote. So what are these genes? We looked at the earliest time point at 2.5 hours and the next digits and five hours. That's karyogamy and S phase. And among these were the, a family of genes called baby boom plethora-like genes. So these genes were first, uh, plethora is involved in root development. The baby boom, the name comes from Kim Botelier's group who showed that orthologs of this gene in Arabidopsis promote some somatic embryogenesis. So if you ectopically express this, you get embryo formation on the leaf or cotyledon surfaces. So it's clearly an embryogenic gene. And some of the other genes, which are Russell-like homeodomain genes, again, orthologs in Arabidopsis are required for embryogenesis. Another early gene was leafy cotyledon. Again, this promotes somatic embryogenesis. So these are all, this is all very satisfying because these are early genes and they're known in other systems to promote embryogenesis. Also, uh, there's a bunch of transcription factors belong to the E2F family. These are known to promote S phase progression in eukaryotes. Uh, with baby boom, we confirmed that the rice ortholog does also make somatic embryos on rice leaves by overexpression. That is, this is an example of a baby boom gene, OSBB1, sufficient to induce somatic embryogenesis in rice. So uh, this leads to a hypothetical hierarchy that in the earliest genes come on baby boom, plus or like genes, and then Wax and Lack and the E2F family. These genes promote patterning and zygot zygotic polarity. These genes are for more basic functions of DNA replication and S phase. And together, you get the first embryonic division. What about the other question then of how the uh, two genomes, the maternal and the paternal, contribute to embryogenesis. To do this, we needed to make uh, hybrids where you could distinguish the maternal and paternal alleles. So we used Japonica to indica reciprocal crosses. And uh, again, this is all published, so I'll just get to the results. Uh, so the y-axis shows you the number of genes. The x-axis is the maternal ratio. So one means all maternal. Zero means all paternal. That means it's co coming only from the maternal genome or only from the paternal genome. And you can see that this is a very large peak. So most genes are, in fact, being expressed only from the maternal genome at the early stages. And uh, so this, in a way, is similar to animals, except this, this includes de novo newly expressed genes. Uh, that are not transcribed in the X cell, but transcribed in the embryo. There are, however, some exceptions that are, in, that are paternally expressed genes and not maternally expressed. So we took a closer look at these exceptions that are paternal, and these included, in, uh, to, somewhat to a surprise, these baby boom genes that I just mentioned are promoters of embryogenesis. So, uh, there are four such genes in rice, and both one, baby boom one and two, show paternal expression. For these, there, were not, not, there was not enough coverage uh, to assign an unambiguously the parent of origin. However, if you look at the sperm cell, and this is ex transcriptome data we did earlier on, 
um, some of these genes are in fact detectable even in the sperm cells, suggesting that all that the whole gene family might be active in the paternal genome from even before fertilization. So, uh, expression of course doesn't mean function. So we looked at whether these genes are in fact functional. The loss of function written in Arabidopsis, by the way, the baby boom gene has no loss of function phenotype, presumably due to redundancy with the plethora genes. However, in rice, if you make a triple knockout of three of the four genes, you get embryo lethality. So that shows that they are both that expressed in zygotes and required for embryogenesis. What was also interesting is that, that you could fully rescue these genes, these mutants, by providing a functional copy from the male, but not by a fully uh, functional copy from the female. That suggests that, uh, so that's shown here in this slide where you have a cross where the maternal uh, BBM white type allele is provided, but the paternal allele is mutant and you still get defective growth. So the paternal allele seems to be particularly important here to promote embryogenesis. So again, uh, we confirmed this requirement uh, in terms of gene expression by using GFP fusions. And using a promoter fusion here, you can show that the, uh, the, if a GFP comes in from the male, it's fully expressed in the zygote, but from the female, it's silent. So although much of the male genome is in fact silent, as I showed you in an earlier slide, a few genes in, are not silent, and that includes these embryogenic factors, the, the baby boom genes. So the male genome is not entirely useless. It's in fact doing something quite worthwhile, which is somewhat satisfying if you happen to be male uh, and uh, a father like my, myself. So, uh, it, so the model then is that embryogenesis is triggered by transcription factors expressed from the male genome. So whereas BBM1, that's one of the genes we, that's most highly expressed in this family, is expressed in sperm cells, it's absent in the egg, but, and it continues to be expressed early on from the paternal allele and not the maternal allele. Okay, and this uh, might be the trigger for embryogenesis. So, uh, what is downstream of these baby genes, and if, we, uh, if it's so important? And we uh, did a uh, study using DEX induction, in, but because you can't really do this in zygotes, you. Uh, it, we had to do it in seedlings, but uh, this is a, should be a familiar system that uh, Gloria Kuruzzi mentioned earlier, uh, the first day. Um, and basically, you add DEX, you get nuclear localization, and and you get here um, trans, uh, transcription of the baby boom gene. Uh, and then, if you look at the earliest genes, these include the yucca. Five, six, ten genes. Okay, this is um, the, the yucca genes. By the way, are involved in ox in bi ox and biosynthesis. So that suggests that one of the earliest stages uh, in the zygotic transition is to make oxen. And oxen, of course, does a million different things. So in a way, that doesn't tell you a lot, but it is it is useful to know that it, whatever it's, uh, the, this gene is doing, it might be acting in part through. Um, manipulation of oxen levels. Uh, we have indirect evidence that this is the case also by, uh, if you make, if you take this fusion and add DEX to it, you get somatic embryos uh, uh, which form on the surface of these rice seedlings. And these include uh, a quite a somatic growths which include aerial root formation. So that again, because root formation is a character typical function of auxin. It suggests that when you're activating this gene, what you're doing is turning, among other things, turning on auxin. Okay, so this is consistent with the upregulation of auxin biosynthesis genes by BBM1. Another thing that BBM1 does is to activate its own expression. So we can, act, I don't want to go into the details, but it's possible to distinguish the endogenous allele using uh, particular primers from the T 
transgenic allele, which is a GR BBM fusion. And we can show that in the presence of DEX and DEX plus cyclohexamide. By the way, in all cases, we showed that, the, including the Yucca genes, we added cyclohexamide, which knocks down protein synthesis to show that these are likely to be direct targets rather than indirect targets. So you can see upregulation of the BBM on endogenous transcript after activation by DEX. So what that means is that once you've turned on BBM1, you don't need to continuously keep expressing it because it's able to keep its, its own expression maintained. So that then leads to a model of embryogen initiation that initially you have the sperm and egg. BBMs are expressed in the sperm cell, not in the egg cell. At 2.5 hours after fertilization, you have activation of yuck genes and auxin. And later on, we've noticed that the female allele, which was silent before, is now active. And this could be a result of the BBM from the male allele cross transactivating the BBM from the female allele. And what, as I said, what, because of the auto activation, you, know, you can now have a self sustaining system which ultimately forms an embryo. Okay. Now, so the next, so if if it's the male genome, if all the male genome is really doing is providing BBM1 as a trigger, then the question was, can you just induce embryogenesis by uh, ectopic expression of this one of this gene in the egg cell? So if you could put an egg cell promoter in front of BBM1, would you get embryo development without fertilization? And if all, if the male is doing something useful, as I suggested, but that use is limited to this one gene, could you dispense with the male altogether? A discomforting thought, but you could do it for worth testing. And so the experiment was to make transgenic plants with the Excel promoter fused to OSP BM1. And the result was we do indeed get parthenogenesis. That is, this is emasculated flowers. They form embryos without fertilization. These embryos have no endosperm, so they will die because you emasculated them. But if you allow them to, uh, well, I'll tell you about that but, uh, later, but the result is parthenogenesis. So the embryo develops without fertilization. So this uh, an embryo, which is haploid because it's from the male or from the female only, no male is needed. In other words, we have virgin birth in a sexual plant. Uh, this is not an entirely new concept, at least in, 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 with humans, it's been the subject of a theological doctrine, which is called the Immaculate Conception. Here is a church called, which, uh, in London, which I borrowed a photo from Wikipedia, but uh, we are pleased to announce such an event in a flowering plant. All right, so then, uh, if you allow endosperm to be fertilized, you can go on to get uh, viable seeds, which are now haploids, because the egg cell is haploid, so the embryo and this will also be haploid, and the plant you get from it is also haploid. This will, of course, be sterile because um, they can't undergo execute meiosis properly. Okay, so summary. Zygotic genome activation is within the one cell zygote. In plant, I believe in all plants, this would be true. Uh, BBM genes express in sperm cells and zygotes, uh, and in zygotes they encode embryogenic transcription factors, triple mutants are embryo arrest, full rescue is only by the male allele, not by the female allele, which means that the male genome has a critical role in initiation of embryogenesis, and if you can, you can circumvent that male role by expression in the female and get parthenogenic haploid plant. This raises several questions, such as why is the male genome mostly silent while the female genome is expressed? And why are the these BBM transcription factors an exception? So when you have two genomes in the same cell and it, uh, there's a difference in allelic expression, that's the definition of epigenetic processes uh, because you have the same DNA sequence but different responses. And so we are now looking at the epigenetics of these gametes and the zygotes 
by, by both small RNA transcriptomes and methylome sequencing. Uh, it's not a, uh, the idea that there's a lot of epigenetic programming is, again, not a new one, but uh, was uh, mentioned as far back as in the 1980s by Barbara McClintock, who said that some system must operate to reprogram the genome in cells of the flower that will produce the gametes and establish the zygotes. So I'll, I'll rush quickly to the next couple of slides, but uh, basically we can isolate these egg cells and sperm cells and do small RNA transcriptomes. Which is, and in the small RNA family, the, the 24 nucleotide siRNAs are by far the most abundant as compared to 21, 22, and 23. So we, I'll focus on this class. And this is a profile of 24, SR, 24 nucleotide siRNAs across the rice chromosomes, 1 through 12. And this is gene density on top. The dips are centromeric regions. And in seedlings, you can see the pattern more or less form, follows the gene density. This is SIR, 24 nucleotide siRNAs. Um, but in sperm cells, it's a very dramatically opposite pattern. You can see that where there are dips here, there are spikes and vice versa. So very clearly the sperm cell has a different epigenome in the sense of small RNA expression. The egg cell is overall depleted in, in small RNAs, but, and they form a pattern that's neither vegetative nor sperm cell-like. So, and this is again illustrated by these dark arrows, but you can see where it's dark here, there's light there, and vice versa, that sperm and seedling. And egg cells don't follow either one. And overall, the egg cells have much fewer siRNAs, about 50,000 loci that we could map compared to several hundred thousand for the sperm and for the seedling. So there is clearly epigenetic reprogramming going on. Uh, we, are not, we are still at the stage of figuring out what this is, going, uh, what this is resulting in. Could they be directing cytomet cytosine methylation, for example, in zygote? So we have ongoing experiments to look at both siRNAs and methylomes of zygotes. So this is where the, it is still a work in progress, but I'm just thought I'll give you an indication of where we are headed. This now allows me to switch to the second part of the talk. So that's the basic science, and, uh, but uh, we, then, we have also been interested in the application of this to something called synthetic apomixis or clonal propagation. And I'll start off by uh, presenting something that you pro as plant biologists you're probably all aware that hybrids do better in most, nearly all crops as compared to inbreds. And this is uh, vividly illustrated by this plot of corn yields in the United States. So with the introduction of hybrid corn, uh, from open pollinated corn, the co yields per acre are more or less constant, but you can see it increasing quite rapidly after hybrid corn was introduced. And uh, it's now four, uh, three or four times as much as less than a century ago. So, and uh, to show you why hybrid corn is better, here's a nice picture which I took from this website. These are the inbred parents, and that's the F1 hybrid. You can see at once it makes a lot more seeds. So. Hybrids are better, but the problem with hybrids is that when you then self them or try, you get assortment of segregation of genes, which means that the progeny are no longer consistently high yielding. And here's a famous experiment from the 1920s showing the inbreds. The first generation is much taller. This is the same guy in every picture. And, uh, and, it's not photoshopped in. It's, uh, it, they didn't have that back then. So, uh, so, and you can see the F2 generation, some are short, some are tall. Okay. So uh, that means in order to get these high yields, you have to keep planting hybrids. And this is great for the seed companies, which have formed a substantial business of making hybrid seeds. And uh, in hybrid corn, it's, it involves, because the male and female flowers are distinct, it just means removing the male flowers physically, and that provides a lot of employment in the Midwest for high school students, keeps them out of trouble. And, uh, and 
but uh, or maybe in trouble because they earn money. But uh, uh, but that's for, that's when you have male and female flowers separated. However, most crops are not like that, and so if you, you for uh, crops that don't do that, like canola, you have to use male sterile mutants, and you can do that, but it's a little complicated uh, because you have to have restorers of fertility. It doesn't do any good to give male sterile plants to the farmer. So, uh, and it, but it can be done, but it's complicated. For rice, that's been a very nice method worked out in China, using three lines uh, to make male sterile and fertility restorers, and to make rice hybrid seeds. But the, although the yield is increased, they are because of this complicated procedure more expensive, and of course they have to be purchased every year. So because you can't retain the high yields. Because of this high price, most of the rice farmers in the world don't plant hybrid rice. And it's 5 to 10% of rice ac acreage in South and Southeast Asia. In Africa, it's virtually unknown uh, to plant hybrid rice. And again, this is a table of which I was able to find. Uh, it's, uh, where it shows that India hybrid rice is about 5%. Africa at zero. China is, I've seen figures from 30 to 50 percent. This, this table shows 50 percent. But China is by far the world's leader. And even there, it's not complete. Unlike corn, where it's virtually 100 percent of the corn in USA is, hi hi is hybrid. So, but we, we do, we could use hybrid rice because we need, this is the global rice production and the projection that we need to meet uh, global demand by 2035. We need this many more million tons. And uh, the additional yield of hybrid rice can help to bridge this gap. So if all the world's farmers switch to hybrid rice, we could actually, without incre increasing acreage or inputs, we could, uh, we could reach this goal. So there are lots of reasons to want hybrids in rice and other crops. and. Uh, one possible solution to the high prices uh, and availability is to use a process called apomixis. Apomixis is asexual reproduction through seeds. Uh, many natural species, over 300 different plant species in nature, uh, uh, avoid uh, undergo apomixis. That means that they avoid meiosis, so there's no genetic segregation, and they produce progeny that are genetically identical to the parent. So synthetic apomix has, has been a long time goal of, uh, of many people working in plant reproduction. This is engineering the apomictic trait into sexual plants. And it has been termed the holy grail. And uh, most recently, I, in, at a plant genome meeting, I ran into Mike Bevan, uh, who works at John Innes. And he, he said, it's the holy grail. And uh, so uh, but I, this is not the first time I'd heard this term. So uh, I went and did some research on the occurrence of holy grail with re relative to apomixis. And you can find this in the scientific literature, the holy grail of agriculture. This is a paper from um, 2016, um, the introduction of apomixis. But it goes further back. Uh, the earliest reference I found was the New York Times 2000, uh, the holy grail of agriculture, yet again. okay. The goal is a plant that will reproduce asexually. So what is the holy grail? And that's the next question. And that turns out to be even further back in the past. There were these knights at King Arthur's table, and they were searching for this cup that uh, the, our savior drank out of. And uh, uh, so this has been, if you like, uh, you, can re uh, you can replace the, the whole, this with synthetic apomixis. Okay. So, uh, and, and what I'll tell you next is how we found the Holy Grail. <laughs> or uh, an alternate title suggested by my friend, <laughs> Professor Jonathan Jones, Order of the British Empire, as making asexuality great to be. <laughs> it's your pick. <laughs> All right, so uh, we have, I've already told you that we had successfully 
made parthenogenic plants using uh, this ectopic expression of this embryogenic factor in the egg cell. But these plants are haploid, and haploid plants are no good. They're sterile, among other things, uh, because they can't execute meiosis. But the solution to the second part was presented to me by, when I was at this meeting, 2016, a rice functional genomics meeting, where I saw this poster from Emmanuel Gertidani and Rafael Mercier, who was in the audience here. And they, turn, they had this poster saying, turning rice meiosis into mitosis. And all, what they did is to knock out three genes that are involved in meiosis, OSD1, PAR1, RECATE, never mind what they do. Maybe, maybe Rafael will talk about it. But uh, this gives a, a genotype called MIME, stands for mitosis instead of meiosis. So you skip meiosis altogether, and these MIME plants make diploid gametes that are unrecombined. So they get diploid hex cells and diploid sperm cells. This is all published in that paper in 2016. So I was very excited when I saw this poster. And by the way, it pays to look at posters in meetings. That's another thing I realized from this. And uh, so I waited anxiously for the paper to come out. And as soon as it came out, I contacted Rafael Mercier. And he was uh, happy to collaborate with us. And so the rest of what I'll tell you is uh, the fruits of that collaboration. So we then decided to, uh, with using information from Raphael and uh, Mercier's group and Guidoni's group, we, we made a triple knockout of these three genes using CRISPR-Cas9 in rice. So OSD1, rec pair one Now, as I told you before, if you, a triple knockout makes MIME plants. MIME means 2N gametes. If you allow them to fertilize, they make 4N progeny through, through sexual reproduction. If the gametes are diploid, the progeny will be tetraploid. What we did, though, is to additionally provide this uh, baby boom expression in the egg cell. So now, if you get parthenogenesis instead of sexual reproduction, you would now get a diploid gamete, which is, made, which is unrecombined, to make a diploid maternal clone. So that's what we were looking for. And it, it, long story short, it worked. We combined MIME and baby M1, and we got, of course, sexual tetraploids, but also apomictic diploids. This is our very first clone, the first diploid, and that was confirmed by flow cytometry. The siblings are tetraploid, they're 4N, but this plant was diploid. And subs we had to show, of course, that this, is all, that this maintains parental heterozygosity, uh, and we had, in the parent, luckily, about 57 SNPs that are heterozygous in the parental plant. And when we sequenced the clones and the grand clones, that is the next generation, both, uh, both of them maintained heterozygous state, all 57 loci. So you could get this by random segregation, but the probability of doing so is 2 times 10 to the negative 7, which seems to us to be unlikely. Uh, and as scientific proof, the discovery of the Higgs boson was a little worse, in, uh, three times 10 to the minus seven. So we are quite confident that this is really clonal propagation. All right, so summary of synthetic apomixes and diploids. We have uh, these lines uh, which produce clonal progeny. The frequencies are still far from the, well, this is our very first shot here. So it's 15 to 30%, which is unacceptable for a farmer, but I thought pretty, not bad for a first shot. I expected zero, because things always go wrong the first time. So I was a bit surprised that it worked at all. Um, and also that this is heritable, with no obvious phenotypic genes. We have grand clones, great grand clones, and now we have six generations of these clones. So and I think there's no reason why we couldn't do this, and at least for three generations. And we also checked the sixth generation at a few loci to make sure that they're still heterozygous. And they are. This is a sixth generation clone. This is wild type. And they're pretty, pretty much OK. They're, if you had a group of these plants, you wouldn't be able to tell them apart. So there's no deleterious effect, as we had feared, at least not for the first six generations. You can also do this for haploids. So if you 
uh, transform baby bone to a haploid plant with the Miami phenotype, you can get uh, gen several generations of haploids. They're fertile because of Miami. So Miami means no meiosis, so the haploids are perfectly fine and you can get haploids to propagate. Future directions, we have to go to something that's acceptable to a farmer and this, they're starting to optimize gene expression and other factors. So we haven't optimized anything yet. This is our first attempt. So we are now trying to do these things and add additional baby booms, for example, to see if we can up there. We can extend to other cereals and I'm, put, I'm confident that the, I don't know why this font is weird, but I did. Okay, anyway, I hope you can read this. Um, you can, so, okay. Uh, we think that extension to other cereals, because the embryogenesis mechanisms are sim similar, it should be straightforward, we hope, anyway, that maize, wheat, barley, etc. Extending to dicots is more finicky because we don't really know enough about early di embryogenesis and dicots. And this is work in progress that we are trying to see if we can extend this to dicots. Uh, as you might imagine, it created some, uh, this, the publication of our work created a lot of uh, discussion in the literature, both scientific and the more sort of lay literature. Um, so not all of which is ac entirely accurate, but, uh, but um, uh, uh, one of, was, and among the discussion was the banana question. So that's my, uh, uh, I say that because it's always brought up to me by people, and I think it's a very good point that you may not know this, but uh, un from, until the 1960s, the most common banana in the world was this banana called Gross Mitchell. And all bananas, by the way, are vegetatively propagated. They're all clones, right? And this came down as a devastating disease for Fusarium. And so uh, there was no resistance available. And now all bananas are Cavendish bananas, no matter where you go. They look like, they look the same. And that's, uh, but now, this is susceptible to emerging diseases. So there is a danger in clonal propagation that you're not prepared for. I'm mentioning all the, the whole thing, good and bad, but, uh, so the bananas are commonly cited as a reason to diversify, but I think it's not a dire threat if we act to keep multiple genotypes in the pipeline. Uh, so as long as you're not, as you're always preparing for new diseases, I don't think it's a problem. Uh, not as dire as sometimes imagined. And even for bananas, remember that Gro Mitchell had a successful run of 60 years, and Cavendish has been around nearly as long. It's not like the next year you have to start changing it. There is a long time before you get these. Uh, so challenge, the commercial challenges, this is good for farmers, especially in developing countries. Uh, for seed companies, maybe not so good, but I think it's okay, you can re revise your business model. First of all, you can make hybrid seeds at lower costs and you, you have superior quality control. So farmers will, uh, might prefer to get that. And also there'll always be a lead for new hybrid varieties, including combating new diseases, like with the banana problem. Of course, there's the usual problems that transgenic technology and we are working at, uh, to get around this, uh, Unfortunately, CRISPR-Cas9 is still needed no matter what, and that's okay in the US, but not so much in the EU, but that's a different matter. So that ends the story of how we got the Holy Grail. I don't like to think of ourselves as these noble knights, but rather, this is a more appropriate analogy, <laughs> I think. So that's <laughs> to how we got there. And uh, I'd like to thank our lab members, Lisa, uh, Sarah and Cameron worked on the uh, psychotic genome activation. Imtiaz was the lead person for synthetic apomixes with help from Deborah Skinner. Lee worked on the small RNAs. And our collaborators, including uh, uh, Scott Russell, Jonathan Ghent, and Rafael Mercier, to whom I should give special acknowledgement because he spent many, many years to develop this MIMI system. And but for his work, we would not be uh, I would not be able to talk about this. And Bin Young, who provided the CRISPR vectors. This is us at the University of California, Davis. Do visit us if we have a chance. I thank you for your attention.
time for questions. So uh, that was fantastic. And I'd also like to be in one of your classes because I learned so much and it was so clear <laughs> and a great. So we don't know if we need to knight you now that you found the <laughs> Holy Grail. OK, that said, I think I have to defend the maternal uh, contribution. Uh, and I guess my question is, in Drosophila, the, uh, the maternal to zygotic transition is actually uh, regulated from the maternal end by a transcription factor called Zelda, which was actually discovered by Chris Rushlow in our department. And Zelda is a pioneer transcription factor that comes in, hits, runs, and changes, opens the chromatin so that the other transcription factors can come in. So, I don't know, is it, and now you're telling us in plants it's paternal, baby boom. Well, at least in, uh, at least in rice and possibly in maize as well because their the, the processes are quite similar. Uh, no, no, I don't, I wouldn't extend our findings to animals by any means, and I don't deny the uh, the maternal, maternal contribution. Yeah, in the matter. Animals, What's the matter? Uh, so, uh, but it's a good question as to why the egg cell. Uh, what's the trigger for that, for Zelda in the egg cell, right? Uh, why why after so many divisions and does it come on? And I'm not really sure. Um, but yeah, in, absolutely in animals, it's clear that the early divisions are driven by maternal factors. And one of the hypotheses for Drosophila and also Xenopus is that even the histones and replication factors are provided by the mother. And when it runs out of histones and replication factors, that's, the, that's when the zygotic transition comes on. Here, they're expressed right away de novo in the zygote. They're upregulated in the zygote but it's maternal. So all the base, the housekeeping genes, and the, I shouldn't call them housekeeping, that sounds somehow demeaning, but <laughs> let's say the, the basic essential cellular processes in the, at the earliest stage are maternal. And as we've shown, the, but there has to be a, a way to stop egg cells from going on to make embryos by themselves, right? And if you want sexual reproduction. You're absolutely right, though. I mean, it's, the paradigm is quite different in animals. And in a way, it's not surprising. Animals and plants evolve sex independently. So the, the divergent, it's amazing to me that they still came up with the solution of a small sperm and a large egg independently uh, you know, from each other. <laughs> That's the matter. <laughs> That's the matter. <laughs> and the form, yeah. <laughs> What's known about apomixis in natural species? Right. Uh, so apomixis seems to have evolved independently in multiple plant lineages. So it's clearly something that can happen uh, and, and independently. And it's not clear what's driving this process. But there are many different ways of getting at apomixis. One is similar to what we just showed. And uh, that is, you have parthenogenesis. I'm sorry, in all cases, you have to lose meiosis, but if you're going through the seed. But in some cases, you actually get somatic embryos that are formed entirely from somatic tissue. So you're not even going through the gametic pathway. That's one type of apomixis. One common type of apomixis is skip meiosis and undergo parthenogenesis. That's similar to this. But there are others as well called apospori, where a diploid cell becomes like an egg cell and then becomes like an embryo without ever going through meiosis or a process. Many, many ways to get apomixis. So, is that sort of answer your question? Or? I don't really know much about the genes. Right. That's again, I, for lack of time, I didn't get into any of those things. but. Uh, it's really interesting that in pearl millet, there's an apomictic wild relative, and the parthenogenesis gene for that was cloned by uh, Connor and Ozias Akins in Georgia, and it's a baby womb like gene. So it has certain, uh, yeah, I, it, in fact, it clusters quite closely with the ri rice baby womb gene in the phylogeny.
So, and one thing I skipped here again, do I have time for a minute or? Yeah, you have time. Okay, uh, is that in this type of apomixis, you still have sexual fertilization, I mean, fertilization taking place of the endosperm. So the endosperm requires fertilization, which I didn't, this is sort of skipped over, but that, that happens in pearl millet and many natural apomixes. as well. The embryo is asexual, the endosperm is still sexual. There are apomix in which even the endosperm is asexual. Um, and that's similar to these mutants that you, the polycomb group mutants, called FIS mutants or Phi mutants or Medea, which have endosperm without fertilization. However, most of these endosperms are bought because you need a maternal-paternal ratio to make of two to one, two maternal, one paternal, to make functional endosperm in most plants. And so that's why we haven't tried to incorporate that into our system yet. Uh, well, first of all, Aristotle was right. They give different contributions, father and mother, correct? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, he was vague enough that he could. <laughs> uh, it, it's yeah. a, a practical question. I mean, if you uh, use the MIME system and get these uh, unreduced gametes that are identical to the uh, parent, and then you don't do the parthenogenesis and obtain a polyploid hybrid, do you gain both the heterosis effect as well as the polyploidy effect or not? Have you looked at that? I'm sorry, say that again? So if you let the unreduced gametes uh, come together to produce a zygote oh, right. without parthenogenesis. All oh, right. So do you get, uh, well, those tetraploid plants in rice are actually mostly sterile. So, so it, I mean, the plants are little, they're not really clearly distinguishable. By the way, we are working mostly with, within the context of an inbred line. So you, there's no heterosis to speak of here. Um, but, but the plants are actually sterile. They're not something that you would want in the field. Mm -hmm. Arabidopsis tetraploids are okay. At least octoploids are not, but rice tetraploids are, are, don't do well in terms of fertility. So if you wanted to um, combat the lack of durability of resistance in, in you know, when all the, the crop individuals are identical, um, you, like one strategy could be polycultures. In, in principle, one strategy could be polycultures. In, but in practice, is it reasonable to imagine breeding mixtures of, of uh, these sorts of crops that would still enable like the production lines to move forward? Uh, yeah, you could, and uh, let's just have the right mixtures of genotypes too. Yeah, to to so something like pyramiding, except that you're uh, they're not yeah. they're being stacked differently. Yeah, absolutely, good good, good idea. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? Rafael, yeah. Very nice talk. Uh, you mentioned that. You think about a strategy to do it without transgene. How can you do that? How can you modify the expression of BBM1 without the transgene? Yeah, there, is, there are complicated ways to do it, and I'll have to talk to you about it later. Uh, but it involves knocking in promoters to the... Uh, but you're still modifying the genome. A better way would be if you could find out what was repressing it in the egg cell and mutated cis element that was required for repressing Excel expression, but that requires more knowledge of the gene in which we do than we have at present, but it's, oh, that's an alternate. 